Welcome back to the next section. We were last discussing LED strips. We're kind of heading into the home stretch here. We're going to kind of wrap up what we were doing with the LED strips. We're not going to go into the electrical part of the LED strips. Instead, we're going to go ahead and build an actual light plane because that is actually the most difficult part, is the construction, the design and the construction, and then we'll pick up the electrical later. Now this is just one of many videos in this sequence. And like I said, we, we're going to eventually move into construction of light planes anyway. But for right now, we're still discussing LED strips, and this segment may actually move into the light planes. It just depends on how long it takes to record it. We like to keep these things 30 minutes or less. We were discussing LED strips, specifically backlight diffusion, or diffusing the LED light energy by means of a aperture diffuser. Where diffusion becomes more critical is with LED strips that have devices that are one color only, as you see in front of you. Well, they are usable for light planes, but require a little more consideration. So we're going to discuss some of that consideration. Here are three LEDs, green, red, and blue. These are the same three LEDs in the image below, but with a membrane of vinyl three quarters of an inch spaced out in front of the devices. If you were to pick up some of that vinyl sheet that I mentioned, brand name is called Stay Put, and you can buy it at your local home improvement center. Uh, but you're not, you don't have to use that particular one. They're so inexpensive, you could buy several and try them to see which one you like the best. So we have a membrane of vinyl three quarters of an inch out in front of the devices. There's some diffusion, but you can still see the individual cones of emission. So the diffusion is actually pretty good. The problem is the overlap. In other words, we need to max the green, the red, and the blue all into one surface. In other words, we want to be able to adjust the red, green, and blue levels to give us as many of those 16 million plus colors that we discussed. It is unfortunate that my camera, and it is an expensive one, does not capture what the human eye does. You have to look closely to see that the spot on the right is blue and the one on the left is green. Now red is obvious. But when you look at the other two spots, and if you look up above uh, at the actual LED devices, you can see the one on the left is greenish, and the one on the left is bluish. But the bluish one still has kind of a little green snuck in there. The green one has a little blue showing up here and there. But when you look at where they've actually, the cones have uh, diverged out a little bit, and you have some diffusion, you have to look close to see which is green and which is blue. Now the one on the right is all bluish, whereas the one on the left, you see a little green here and there. They actually look better than this with the human eye. It's the camera uh, that doesn't quite get it. So let's bring up a slide that we looked at very early in this series of lectures. Remember that there are three separate views here. You can't see all three of these graphics simultaneously. You're going to see the three dots on the bottom, or the side view in the middle, or the surface view at the top. So let's superimpose the direct view of the LEDs and the diffuse spots from the previous slide into this slide. First, the LEDs view directly from front. You're looking at green, red, and blue. Now we're going to actually put the actual LEDs right there to take their place. Then the spots as they appear on the opposite side of the diffuser from the LEDs. The cones of emission, the middle graphic, that's a view you'll probably never see. You would have to put some fog in the room or some smoke or heavy dust in order to see those cones of emission. We're just trying to illustrate that the light diverges out in a conical shape and makes spots on the walls in this case, that dashed line, see it says vinyl film aperture diffuser. Those cones of emission diverge out and create those three spots when you look from the other side of the film. 
Once more, only this time, we will allow the photo images to fade out of the graphics of the two views. Watch carefully. Okay, fade that one back in first. So you can see the comparison here to early slides. Now we'll fade them out. I just wanted to kind of bring full circle the graphics we were using earlier to the reality, just in case that wasn't grasped back then. Now, if this is moving too slowly for you, all this repetition, then fast forward until you get to something you're interested in. I'm doing this for the folks who really want to create light planes and all of this is very new to them. Now, I do spend a lot of time explaining technical things and I don't just mean the industrial computers and PLCs that my my channel is really mainly about. I spend a lot of time explaining technical things to children and people that have no technical education. Those are who I'm after. They want to make light planes for their platform or for their church and I want to explain to them how to use light to do that. Now, back to our LED strip that we were working with. The upper image is a direct view of the LEDs, and the lower image was created by placing a piece of that vinyl film three quarters of an inch out from the LEDs. This gives you an idea of the angle of cones of emission. Let's try the vinyl film at varying distances from the LEDs to compare the effectiveness of the diffusion. One inch out, and notice the halo around the blue. If you look at the blue LEDs directly on the left, in other words, looking directly at them, you see a halo. So the blue evidently scatters more light than the green or the red LEDs. I question the equivalency of the red and green LEDs with the blue LEDs. Well, what it is is what it is, so we continue two and a half inches out, and the diffusion is much better, but the mixing is terrible. It's just not there. In other words, you can still see the red, green, and blue. Now you see a little yellow in there, you see some cyan, so there is some overlap at two and a half inches out, but not enough overlap to get really good mixing. So there's diffusion, that's scattering the light, and then there's mixing. Uh, for lack of a better term, I'm, I'm calling it mexing. Basically, it means getting the different colors to all hit the same spot. We want this film far enough out from the strip. The All the blue LEDs create a cone, the edges of which overlap. Well, if the blues are all overlapping and the reds and the greens are overlapping, then they'll all be mixed together. So for lack of a better term, I just call it mixing. But the mixing is not complete yet here at two and a half inches out. Because the devices are spread out, the colors that is, we need more depth to allow each color to reach the same color with the outside edges of the spots, meaning that we need enough overlap to allow each red spot to overlap the two adjacent red spots and the green and blue spots as well. I think you get the drift here. This style of RGB LEDs presents a challenge for a light plane if you want a smooth, even, even distribution of color over the entire plane. Personally, I would not waste my time and effort with this type of RGB LED strip for a light plane, especially of the aperture diffusion type. Later on, I'm going to, in a second project, show you what I call white holes where I use indirect surface diffusion and I get away with using these multiple colored LEDs and it blends very well. Maybe blending instead of mixing would be a better term. Oh well, I already started mixing. Maybe I'll start calling it blending anyway. But there is good use for them in, in other words, I'm saying don't use these for your aperture diffusion type light plane. But there is good use for them later when we work with just surface diffusion. Okay. This is an excellent demonstration of the results of surface diffusion and blending, comparing the effect of increasing the distance from the LEDs to the surface diffuser. We have the very same LED strip that we used in the previous examples. That's what you're looking at right here. Red, green, blue, red, green, blue. Well, actually, depends on which way, what order you go in. 
we have the very same LED strip that we used in the previous examples. The very same that I said I would not use for an aperture diffuser, but that it was good for a different application of light diffusion. Let's tie wrap this strip of LEDs to a yardstick. If you don't know what a yardstick is, a long, flat, thin board. The yardsticks, you don't see many of them anymore, but they used to be quite prevalent. And we're going to take tie wrap this to a yardstick, and then we're going to rest one end of it on a surface diffuser, and the other end on a spacer that is three inches above the surface diffuser. The surface diffuser is the same one that we used earlier. It's a 3 8 sheet of plywood painted with a matte white paint. If you look closely, you can see the texture of the wood surface revealed as apparent texture in the painted surface. So if you look closer at the top of the image where you see some green, that's where the yardstick is resting against the surface diffuser. And then towards the bottom, you see that the yardstick is further and further away from the surface. At the end where the LEDs are very close to the surface diffuser, there is no overlap. You can see it's green, red, blue. The next set of LEDs, you start to see some white and cyan. And as you move further and further away from the surface diffuser, and remember this should be white light or roughly white because it's red, green, and blue. They're all three turned on together. So you see, you don't even have to get three inches away from this surface diffuser. And not only do you have good diffusion, you've got good mixing or blending as well. As the strip is progressively further and further away from the surface diffuser, the overlap increases until there is total overlap and mixing or blending of the wavelengths is near perfect. Okay, let's build a light plane. This is surface diffusion. The next project isn't going to really use surface diffusion. It's going to go back to the aperture diffusion, but a project that I'm going to put slides together for at a later date will use this surface diffusion. Actually, I prefer the surface diffusion. It's less trouble. You don't have to deal with apertures and films and fabrics, and it's much easier to construct. Okay, so designing a backlit light plane. First you need to decide what the rough dimensions are going to be. And the rough dimensions really means rough because when you actually start putting details on it, you're going to have to modify those dimensions to work well with the building materials that are available and the LED light strips. Where are you going to mount it? Are you going to hang it on the wall? Is it going to be freestanding? Is it going to be freestanding and leaning against the wall? Where will it be installed? What is the viewing distance? In other words, where will it be seen from? What is the viewing angle? Will the video camera see it? Will it be in a recorded video image? Will anyone be standing in front of it while on camera? Where you're going to install it has a lot to do with the dimensions. If someone's going to be standing in front of it, and recorded, it may interfere with the recording and make that person's face appear very dark. Now these considerations will determine the approximate dimensions of the structure. The structure consists of a plane to mount LEDs on, one or more aperture diffusers, and a box to put the diffusers at the distance required to get the effective results from the LED cones of emission that you desire. In other words, the right amount of diffusion and blending. Aside from the aperture diffusers, the rest of the structure is your white hole. So if you remove the diffusers off the front, what's left is the white hole, the white box or the light box. Uh, traditionally, when you use the term light box, a lit surface for viewing slides, photographic slides comes to mind. So I like to stay away from the term light box and use white hole or white box. The depth of the white hole or white box, whichever you want to call it, is determined by the quality of diffusion and blending that you need. The depth will also influence the materials that you use for the structure. Actual width, not approximate width, 
is determined by the spacing of the LED strips on the surface diffuser. The height, width, weight, and installation location will determine the actual materials required to build the structure. Will it be hanging on the wall, freestanding against a wall, or freestanding in an open area? Each of those requires some specific considerations for strength and balance. It is not necessary to compromise the length to match the lengths of the LED strips. You'll realize that later because you can accommodate any length with the LED strips. Don't worry about wasting a few LED segments on the LED strips because you're going to invest more of your resources and the labor and the time than you will in the actual hardware. So why scrimp on LED strips when it is a very small fraction of the overall investment? If you're thinking that your time is free, think again. You need to sit down and really seriously reconsider that type of thinking. Depth is determined by quality of diffusing and blending. Width is determined by the spacing of the LED strips, or you can go the other way. You have a width that you want to stick to. Then you have to be able to work out your spacing for the LED strips to accommodate that width. Height and width determines the materials for the back panel and any extra frame support, as well as how you're going to cut the five meter strips into shorter strips for mounting. Now, when I say extra frame support, if you go with a lot of depth or length, then the side frame members are going to have a tendency to want to pull together if you stretch something tight across the top. That means you'll have to add some gussets or some support from the back panel that keeps the sides rigid and straight, vertical. Now when it comes to the actual construction, you can paint one side of the back plate and it is now the surface diffuser. If you use masonite or some other inexpensive press board, painting it before you mark out the strip locations and tie wrap hole locations will make it easier to see what you are doing. And after all, no one's going to see the pencil marks through the aperture diffusers. They won't show up. So we are going to build a 24 by 72 inch aperture diffuser. We're also going to build some 24 by 24 light planes, but first we're going to do the 24 by 72. That's two foot by six foot. These dimensions will not require extra stiffening of the structure that will be needed with the aperture diffusers when building a larger light plane. So we're sticking to a small one. I consider two six two feet by six feet, a small light plane. Okay, the actual components of a light plane, we're going to consider them conceptually before we actually consider them as building materials. Starting with the furthest away point of view, the element or the component that's furthest from your view when you're looking at the light plane, and that is the surface diffuser. This is what you will mount the LED strips to. This is a sheet of material that is physically light enough, I don't mean color light, but physically light enough that if you're going to hang the panel on the wall, it, it, it's still strong enough to keep the entire frame rigid. So it's a balance between weight and rigidity. It has to be rigid enough to hold the, the whole panel rigid and flat. The matte white surface is extremely important. You have at least two options here. Paint or reflective matte material adhere to the supporting base sheet, gluing something on that back plate that is reflective. So far, all that you have seen in my examples is plywood painted matte white with a latex paint of the ordinary variety. But later, you will see some surfaces that I used where I used projector screen material, which is a much better surface diffusion. This material can be purchased very inexpensively off of eBay. I think some people call it blackout sheet or blackout material, but it's projector screen material. It's extremely flat white and it's kind of a rubbery uh, substrate, but you can cut it and glue it with contact cement on your rear surface. Now you don't need to do that for an aperture diffuser. But when, later on, when we get to the total surface diffusion light planes, then it might become important to use some of that material. Okay, the next, okay, there's our white surface that we're going to mount our LED strips on. Next thing we do is mount our LED strips onto that surface. They are tie wrapped to the front 
of the surface diffuser lengthwise. If the structure is rectangle, if it's a square, there is no lengthwise, right? This affords the fewest cuts of LED strips and the fewest points of failure for your electrical design. So you wouldn't want to cut the strips up widthwise. In other words, they have a whole bunch of real short strips. Now there are some reasons that you might do that if you're after really special effects. For instance, if you wanted a, we'll call it a diffuse bar of light to chase across the screen. In other words, if you cut these strips up into shorter pieces, instead of having three the long way, you would probably have nine in the other direction. You'd have nine shorter pieces, because remember you have three every two foot. Well, you can control them individually. In other words, you don't have to hook them all up to one control, so they're all three strips are doing the same thing simultaneously. You can control them individually. So you could turn on one at one end and then fade that out as you turn the next one on and keep doing that across the screen and you, you would have a two foot tall bar of light drifting across the screen. So there's all kinds of cool things you, do, you can do. And we will get into some of those much later in more advanced sessions. We have the surface diffuser and then to that, we attach our LED strips. Now, the primary structure of the light panel, or the light plane, is the mixing spacer, the blending spacer. The depth of which you determine by experimenting with the distance between the LEDs and the primary diffuser surface, which would be the vinyl film. So once you purchase your LEDs, you know, lay them out flat, turn them on, and then hold a hold a piece of material above them to determine at what depth you get really good blending, diffusion and blending. Now keep in mind, you'll see within a short time here, either in this clip or the next one, that it takes a secondary diffuser to really get good blending. Now you might be satisfied with just a single diffuser. This is the primary aperture diffuser right here. Now it's a white surface, but Really, it's just a film or a piece of material that the light from those LEDs on the back panel is going to emanate through. And when it comes through, the light's going to be scattered. Now, you might be satisfied with the results of a single aperture diffuser, but the vinyl film is highly vulnerable to stretching and ripping if located near people in motion. In other words, if you just had the vinyl diffusion, or even if you had two vinyl diffusers, a primary and a secondary, and you've got these up on the stage or on a platform and somebody swings around with their guitar or a speaker swings around with something in his hand, it can stretch that vinyl film or rip it and you're not going to be happy with that. Replacing it is tough business. A secondary diffuser, aperture diffuser, of a material that may be less efficient as a diffuser but more durable as far as incidental contact is concerned. I can't imagine you using just one diffuser. You need the secondary diffuser for no other reason than to protect the primary diffuser. Let's talk construction. We're going to go through the same images again, but we're going to talk construction. The surface diffuser needs to be of a material that is appropriate for mounting LED strips and when attached to the blending or mixing spacer, it provides rigidity to the entire structure. Something has to absorb the stress when the panels are handled or leaned against, and you do not want the aperture diffusers to realize this stress. You want the white hole, the box, if you will, rigid enough where if somebody leans on it or when they're handling and installing it, they're not twisting the aperture diffuser. Now plywood is the best because it's it has biased plies that provide strength and stability. For those of you that do not know, you th maybe think you know what plywood is, you've heard the term all your life. Basically plywood is made by, well they, what they do is they peel logs. In other words, they spin the logs and they have a great big long blade, the length of the log and it peels off a very thin layer of wood. So when they get done, they got this great big 
flat sheet of wood about a sixteenth of an inch or less thick. So what they do then is they take multiple layers, but they alternate the direction of the grain. They apply adhesive and then they put it under high pressure and press it together and that's plywood. Now, everyone knows that wood, lumber, when exposed to humidity and drying cycles can twist and change shape. Plywood, because the plies are biased, in other words, they travel in different directions, they oppose this warping and twisting. Plywood is the best to use. Now, all wood is hygroscopic and therefore subject to absorbing moisture out of the atmosphere and then yielding it back during dry periods. Every time wood goes through this cycle of absorbing moisture and then drying out, not only can the wood move and shape, it also becomes, it loses its, um, it lowers its kindling point. Now, we don't care about that for light planes because there's not enough heat involved. Just thought I would throw that in there. Uh, another material, which is what I used in the Dominican Republic because that was what was easy to find down there and inexpensive, was masonite. That's actually a brand name. It's a dark brown, reddish brown press board. Uh, if you buy pegboard that has holes in it, that's masonite. Now, it's not all called masonite anymore, but originally it was called masonite. However, masonite, even though it's inexpensive, it is fragile. It breaks off the corners if you drop, and it even can crack and tear if you don't handle it properly. And then there's press bar board or particle board. It is also fragile to cracking and breaking, not to mention it is heavy. If you've ever built any of those furniture kits that have a press board, particle board, with a paper veneer over it. It might even have real wood veneer. You remember how heavy that stuff is. You don't want to use that. It's not just heavy, but it's fragile. It can't handle dropping and uh, any flexing. It's too rigid. It'll break. So there we've covered that material right there. That's the LED strip mounting, or you could call it the surface diffuser. Then there's the LED strips themselves. They can be tie wrapped to the surface diffuser using drill holes space to accommodate the spacing on the LED strips, or if you want to try the double-sided tape, be sure to properly prepare the surface, the light diffuser surface, before attaching the strips. That means in order to attach that double-sided tape, the surface is going to have to be smooth, which means you want to paint the smoothest side, the smoothest side of your mounting plane. You may even want to sand it down a little bit so you get a really nice smooth surface. Now it is possible to use a gloss white paint and then some sanding, repainting uh, cycles. And then the last thing you do is take steel wool and you uh, wipe the entire glossy surface with steel wool. It leaves it white, but it is also irregular and acts as a good diffuser. And then after the LEDs, of course, then we have the light mixing spacer or the blending spacer, the light blending spacer. And this must be either dimensional lumber or constructed of assembled structured members. Dimensional lumber, one by, you know, one by two, one by three, one by four, one by six, one by eight, one by 12, one by 10. All of those have been out there or are out there available on occasion. Remember, that the actual dimensions are not one inch by whatever. It's actually about three quarters of an inch. So a one by six is three quarter by five and a half. So do, and do not cut these boards to length with a handsaw. So once you've purchased your uh, lumber for your light blending spacer, that it's basically a frame, a rectilinear frame, don't cut these boards to length with a handsaw. They must be as square as possible on the ends. Take the time to square up your cutoff saw or have them cut by someone that has the right equipment. This is very critical. And, and we're not talking about a lot of, of cutting. So once you figure out all your dimensions for your boards, you could just take the lumber to someone that you know that has good equipment and tell them what you want. 
Well, the other thing that we mentioned, assembled structure members. They're stronger, lighter, and more stable, but they require excellent carpentry skills. So we won't discuss the structure members in this series, but we'll save it for an advanced series. But just to give you a sneak peek, it would be similar to the beams that sometimes are used for floors and houses. They're a constructed beam. So the vertical component is plywood, and then on each edge, you have a piece of one by material glued to it. And what this does is improve the rigidity. The, it, it stabilizes the shape of it quite a bit by doing this. Okay, so there we got it. There's our white hole, basically, with some LEDs mounted to the back. The primary diffuser comes up next. And it can be inexpensive vinyl drop cloth sold at your local home improvement center. As I said, I use the stay put, but the stuff is so inexpensive, so you might as well buy whatever you can find and then try it out. And if what you purchase doesn't work, go back and buy something else. I mean, you can always use some drop cloths laying around the house for something. In other words, buy some and experiment. And it can be this film right here, this vinyl, it can be bonded directly to the top of the light blending spacer or bonded to a separate frame and then attached to this frame, the frame of the light blending spacer with screws. I've done it both ways. The one I'm going to show you here in a bit is strictly glued directly to the frame. We have one more item and that's the secondary diffuser. I use broadcloth. For this one. The secondary diffuser must use a more durable material to withstand accidental contact with any activity around it. I use white broadcloth from Hobby Lobby. You might even try using broadcloth for both primary and secondary diffusers if you don't want to fool around with the vinyl film. The problem with any woven fabric is that it has a weave and the direct light from the LEDs will squeeze through the weave, thereby escaping diffusion. So as you look at the front, you will see tiny little brilliant specks of light where the direct light from the LED has slipped right through the weave. So the primary diffuser, the vinyl, will not allow any direct light, really, to come through. Then the secondary diffuser, not only is it a diffuser, but it is also a durable material that will protect the primary diffuser and it's easier to replace. So if it gets torn, and that it would take a lot to tear a broadcloth. I mean, if you had a sharp instrument and you swing around, it, it, might, it might tear it. But just incidental contact's not gonna damage the broadcloth. Well, we've gone more than 30 minutes. So we're gonna stop right there. It's not a bad place to stop. We've covered the basics of design for your first light plane, but we haven't actually shown you any construction. In the next clip, we will be immediately into actual construction of your first light plane, or at least the first one that I built that I took pictures of that I can put into a video.